We'll sing the first, third, and the fourth with everyone standing. First, third, and the fourth. Nothing but the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Number three. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Number four. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And a good evening. Welcome to church tonight. So glad to have you all here for this Wednesday evening Bible study. And this place has been hopping all week long uh, with people and with your things, many of your things. Uh, how many of you have dropped something off for the tag sale this week? Would you raise your hand? I got to say, White Oak Baptist Church, you got a lot of stuff. <laughs> lots and lots and lots of stuff. And um, we, ladies have been up there furiously tagging things, getting ready for our tag sale this Saturday. And they can't keep up. They can't keep up. And so we'll say more about that in a minute. But thank you. And it's going to be a great day on Saturday. Uh, weather looks like it's going to be nice and pretty. And if you don't have plans on Saturday, just go ahead and plan on coming here from 9 o'clock to about 3 o'clock. We're going to have a gigantic tag sale and baked goods sale and a barbecue. And um, it's all happening right here on the grounds of White Oak Baptist Church. So this will be the place to be on Saturday. Come and bring your pocketbook and the proceeds are going to go to help buy the church a bus to get more boys and girls to church to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and to be loved on. So amen to that. It's been neat to see our bus ministry at work. Our bus ministry lately has been bringing not just little, little boys and girls, which we love when, when uh, little boys and girls come, but been bringing entire families. We've had several entire families come lately because of our bus, and several have gotten saved in their homes on Tuesday evening visitation. And um, uh, and various things and just beginning to get grounded in our church. Some of them have been showing up to everything, even finding their own ways to church on Sunday night. And it's been really neat to see. So don't let anybody tell you the bus ministry still doesn't work because it absolutely works. And right. we're very thankful that we have one here at our church. Well, let's greet one another in the Lord. Why don't you play through that, Lizette? And we'll come back and sing that chorus in just a minute. All right, as you find your way back to your seats, let's sing that chorus. Oh, precious is the flow. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And as we go to the Lord in prayer tonight, let's uh, ask that God do a, a great work in our midst tonight as we pray. And uh, we take our petitions to heaven and, uh, and just so that, that that's a blessed time. And also for the 
opening of the word in the Bible study. We'd ask Brother David Greer, good to have you in service tonight. He's usually upstairs running around with the kids that gets to be in the service tonight. If you would open us in prayer. Amen. You can be seated. How many of you have a prayer request slip that's filled out, ready to go? If you'd hold that up, or if you need one, uh, if you'd hold up an empty hand, we can get you one of those as well. And we just as a reminder, we do have those prayer request slips available uh, for you as you're coming in the door. And so be mindful of that. That way we can expedite the service. But if you need one, uh, if you'd hold up your hand, we can get you one. And if you have one ready to go, uh, hold that up and hold it high so we can take care of that. With the, uh, the tag cell coming up, our fellowship hall is filled with uh, what would look like someone's gr- uh, attic, rather, or garage. And um, uh, so Master Clubs is being handled a little bit differently this evening. Uh, we're not running a traditional Master Club. Uh, we do have all the kids upstairs and, and Pastor Dave's entertaining them, but we do have many of the Master Club workers in here with us for the Wednesday evening Bible study. So they get a much needed night off and coming up we'll be taking a summer break from that and they'll uh, they'll be in here with us regularly Amen. all right are there others okay others that are coming wasn't the memorial day picnic great how many of you got to come out to that that was uh somewhat well attended i've heard it's been bigger in years past with the rain and whatnot may have held a few people back there were still a lot of people there and the food was good, fellowship was good. We tried to have a softball game, but the rain kind of kept us back a little bit. We did get out there and play a little bit, but what a great time that was. So, amen. All right, at this time we'll have Brother Sagru come up, and he's going to uh, run our prayer service at this time. And uh, let's, uh, let's uh, but very mature in Christ, let's take our petitions of the Lord in prayer and ask him to do something great uh, in our midst with that. Brother Sagru. Good evening. Okay, uh, does anybody else have any requests? Because I'll, I'll read these that I received, and then uh, I have one other one. Okay, Marie Yankowski's uh, asking for a prayer for her niece, uh, Connie Cesari, is that the right name? Uh, who has been dizzy off and on for two days, also she is not saved. Okay, we'll pray for, uh, is it Connie? That's correct, right? Uh, also, uh, this is anonymous, and it says, a husband uh, connection of uh, is that, I'm not sure if that's connection. So uh, they're, they're asking for um, a husband who uh, has some sin problem and uh, for true repentance and deliverance and also to find the truth. Okay, and then Val Chippio is asking for uh, Tim, for God to work in his heart, and uh, Tim Sr. for safe travels uh, today uh, home from Vermont. And then Pauline is asking for her daughter, Pauline, uh, needs full-time uh, job plus benefits. And then uh, last week I had one I couldn't read, but I, with my wife's help, uh, we uh, were able to, she was able to really read it, not me. But uh, this is from Ed Bedet, I believe, and it's uh, regarding a friend who is uh, passing away. Uh, the person only has uh, three to six months to live. So we want to pay, pray for that friend as well as uh, pray uh, for the salvation of that friend, not knowing whether he's, that person's saved or not. Okay, why don't we, uh, and, and what I'm going to do is uh, George and Michael come up, and if any of the men would like to come forward, and uh, Neil, during our prayer time, you, you're certainly welcome to. Okay? Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this uh, time that we can come to your throne of grace. And uh, as Pastor mentioned, uh, uh, this is a, a, a serious time to bring our petitions, our prayers, um, our requests. Uh, God, we certainly know that you know all about them. But, uh, Lord, it, it's on, our, on our behalf, we need to, to, to plea with you. We need to bring them to you uh, so that we can, God, so you can see truly our, uh, the earnest heart that we would have, the, uh, the truth that we would have in, in, in our concerns for for souls to be saved, for people to be healed, for um, families to be healed, and what have you. So, Lord, we do come, and uh, we thank you for the for the, the, the avenue of coming, uh, that we can freely come, and we thank you, Lord, for your, your ear that bends to hear our prayers. 
And uh, Lord, we're just thankful for your grace and your love. And uh, Lord, we thank you for, for the many blessings you do pour out. But at this time, we do pray, Lord, for um, Pauline's daughter, uh, who needs a full-time job with benefits. And uh, Lord, we do uh, lift up Pauline's uh, daughter before you and ask God that you would provide uh, for her needs, uh, for her uh, job to provide an income, and uh, Lord, also for her benefits uh, for, for that, that she would have in the way of health insurance and other things. But Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would open a door and that she would uh, have that, um, be able to receive a, a job and know that it's from you. Lord, I pray that she would give you the honor and, uh, and be thankful to you for the job. And then we also pray for Val Chippio's uh, request for, for both um, the son, Tim, for God to work in his heart, as well as uh, for, well, just stir his heart. He's a young man, he's a, and he, uh, Lord, I, and I know we, uh, there's a lot of oats to be sown or whatever, but um, Lord, I just pray that you'd uh, stir his heart in such a way that he would uh, surrender his, uh, his will, his life to you, and that he would honor you. And uh, Lord, I don't know the, the, the situations that go on. I do know teenagers, uh, we've had them. And uh, Lord, so I do know some of the difficulties. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would uh, give both Val and Tim uh, a strength as they uh, uh, raise Tim, Timothy or Tim. And uh, just give, give him a heart too that would be tender to, to be listening and, and, and uh, obedient to um, their mom, his mom and dad. And so Lord, I do pray in that manner for Tim. And then we pray for Tim Sr. that you'd give him traveling mercies as he travels uh, home from Vermont, uh, maybe later this evening. And so, Lord, I just pray you keep him alert, keep him awake, uh, give him mercies, traveling mercies and, and safety. And uh, we do ask that in Jesus' name. And then we also pray <clears throat> for this one. It's anonymous. I, for the husband, uh, for just uh, um, conviction uh, to, uh, regarding sin and that the person would... Uh, this man would uh, know the conviction of God, know the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and this, they would just uh, feel, the, feel the conviction and, and desire to want to do right. And uh, Lord, I know we all do wrong, so, and, and we're thankful for the Holy Spirit's conviction at those times, but Lord, I pray for this particular individual that you would, uh, that this man would show true repentance and, and deliverance from his, uh, from his situation. And uh, Lord, we do pray that the truth would just uh, stir his heart and prick his heart. And then, Lord, we pray also for uh, uh, Connie, uh, Marie Yankowski's um, niece, uh, who has been dizzy, uh, and that's been gone, going on and off for the last two days. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, just touch her body, uh, touch her uh, head, in a, in a sense of just keep getting, uh, removing that dizziness. Uh, but, Lord, I pray that you would uh, help her uh, with this physical uh, infirmity right now, and that it wouldn't be anything uh, that's uh, you know uh, life-threatening or difficult, but something that could be easily uh, remedied. And uh, then, Lord, we do pray for her salvation, for Connie's salvation, that she would uh, know the uh, the Lord in a personal way, and she would trust Jesus Christ as a, as her Savior. And then uh, also, I'm going to lift up uh, Ed Bidette's uh, friend. Um, who uh, is, is uh, in a very serious situation, um, person's passing. So Lord, I just pray, uh, I don't know whether this is a, a man or a woman, it's a friend of Ed's. I just pray that this person, uh, that you'd give them grace during this time of, uh, of their uh, difficulty during this storm of their life. I would pray, Lord, uh, for their salvation. I don't know if they're saved. I pray if they're saved. If they are saved, I pray, Lord, that they would know the peace of God. But if they're not saved, Lord, I, I pray that they would know the, the Holy Spirit's conviction and that they would come to, to know Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior. I would pray, Lord, that they would trust Christ as Savior. And uh, Lord, I pray you'd be with Ed too, because uh, Ed's a... A uh, fine man. Uh, he's a good witness. I pray that you would uh, empower him to be able to share the gospel with his friend if it need be. I pray that you, you would be with him to be able to share in times of prayer with his friend. And I just pray, Lord, that you would uh, uh, give grace to this situation. And uh, God, that you would just uh, work a miracle there. Now, Lord, we do pray for all these that we've lifted up now. And uh, Lord, we're going to continue to pray for others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Lord, I thank you for this, which I regard as the sweetest part of the service on a Wednesday night when we can lift up our thoughts, our hearts, and our prayers, supplications unto you in a corporate manner. Almost like the witness of two, Father. We thank you for your hearing ears, your loving heart. Father, I just want to piggyback John's thoughts and sentiments and prayers for, the, for those that are lost, and in particular, Michael Casalias, Michael Patella, Lori Wilson. Father, none, none of us know how much time we have left on this earth, where we'll be in the next hour. Things change so rapidly. But to be removed from this earth and Jesus, to not to know you, I can't think of any worse situation that a soul could be in. So Father, for these three, for those that Brother John mentioned before, and for the others that are on the list for salvation this week, Oh, God, I would ask that you move in their hearts. You know their minds. You know their attitudes. Some are softer than others. Some are have situations in their lives that they may, may cause to blame you for. But God, I do ask that you soften their hearts as soon as possible. Put, put people into their lives that are going to Share the good news of Jesus Christ. Share the gospel, the true gospel. The way that's written. Jesus, the way that you had it sown. That none be lost. That the mansions in heaven be filled. That many, many get to see that, that wonderful river in heavens. <clears throat> I left up our president. President Trump, Father, you, you really know his heart. You, you know him better than anybody. And from all outward appearances, we know him as a man that's headstrong. He has his mind made up. And he's not afraid to speak his mind. God, if uh, he doesn't know you the way that he needs to know you, I just pray that uh, by your mercy, not only for him, but for the people that he's serving over these four years, that he'll come to you first. He'll seek you. He'll seek your face. Ask you for directions. And at the same time, Lord, I pray that you'll just place a hedge of protection around President Trump at this time. As we see the news, we hear about the bombings, the suicide bombings, the threats, the uh, terrible sense of humor, jokes that are being done recently. Father, really, I do pray, hedge of protection around our president, around our vice president, upon all our leaders. And for Mayor Loretti, the mayor of Shelton, served many, many years in the town of Shelton. I just pray that, uh, Lord, if Mark does not know you, that that will change. And as he uh, is currently seeking other positions, particularly in the state and the state government, that you would cause him to realize that promotion comes from above, not, not from ourselves. Pray you give Mark, as I know him, Mayor Loretti, a heart for you, a heart for the people that he's serving, not only wisdom to serve the city of Shelton, but to have godly wisdom as well. I lift up Joe Delgado serving in our army right now. I don't know where, where he's serving, whether it's domestically or in a foreign land. But for Joel, I, I pray 
you'll place your hedge of protection around him as well. Protect him. And those that he's serving with, thank you that you give that you gave Joel a, 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 the, the burden to serve his country. He lifts up his family as well. Give them peace, knowing that their son Joel is in your hands at all times. Jesus, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Lord, we just want to, at this time, lift up a few requests from the health side. And God, before I do, I just pray for these individuals, uh, all of them really. Um, many are friends of friends or extended family, and I don't know about their spiritual state, but we pray most of all for their salvation, that they would call upon you, Lord, and uh, you would do a work in their life. But God, I pray for Stanley Wolbuck. Um, it's a very serious form of cancer, pancreatic cancer. But no matter how serious it is, God, you can do all things. I pray you give him uh, the grace he needs and the strength he needs. We pray for, uh, Jamie has a request for Nate, a four-year-old with uh, a brain tumor. I pray it's operable. And I pray you'd restore that child's health. We pray for uh, Sherry's husband having surgery on June 6th. I don't know. Uh, about the details, but we know you do. And I pray you be with the family. I pray you would heal him. I pray you give the doctors wisdom and be a complete success. And God, I pray for Jim Rowe in Cuba. I know in the recent past, there's been some changes there. And I just pray that uh, they would allow the missionaries to do your work. They won't try to hinder the gospel being preached, that you put a hedge of protection about him and his work. I pray for Randy and Kelly. It was a blessing to have them here. And I just pray that you'd help them as they gear up for another missions trip to Armenia. I pray, God, uh, you would help them with that. And I pray, Lord, their, their work would go forward and the gospel would go forward. I pray, God, that... Uh, Nothing, there won't be any stumbling blocks in their way. Please help them with the work, God. We pray for Chad and Crystal Blake, uh, whatever their needs might be. I pray, God, that you'd help them uh, face the obstacles they have to face. We pray for Diane McHugh in Bridgeport. You'd help her, God, and give her the grace she needs. And we pray for our brother Chase. You'd help him. Um, it was a blessing to see the college students stand up here on Sunday, and I, I pray you'd just help him with his studies and the decisions that he makes. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our hymnals again and turn in them to hymn 360. There is a fountain. We'll sing the first, the third, and the fifth. <clears throat> And let's all stand, please. Thank you. <clears throat> there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, and sinners plunged beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Number three. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Be saved sin no more, till all the ransom
some church of God be safe to sin no more. Number five. When this poor list brings stammering tongue, lie silent in the grave. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. You can be seated. Before we have our ushers come, we're going to read our missionary letter. This one's from uh, Swanti and Linda Linquist. Uh, and it says, Dear Praying Friends, time has been moving at a rapid pace for the, this past few months. Thank you for your prayers. March 17th found me back in Jamaica for a week of preaching on Baptist, Baptist distinctives and marriage at Bethel Baptist Church in Old Harbor with folks attending from four, uh, from four other sister churches. It caused quite a stir in that some of the folks who attended had either not heard or had not understood what it, what it means to be an independent fundamental Baptist. One message was, how much did it cost to build this church? Some of the history of the martyrs and the suffering that they face for holding to the doctrines of the Word of God uh, was explained. The pastor told me that usually everyone went home within 15 minutes after service. However, they stood in the parking lot for over an hour discussing the sermon. Uh, as for the first time, some realized the importance of the doctrines for which many had given their lives. Each night the attendance grew, and by the time the last message was preached, on the wife's need of submission to her husband, the parking lot had become quite the place for active discussions, for the men anyway. No, I'm just teasing. Um, one must remember that the majority of islands in the Caribbean are matriarchal, that is, the ladies have the last word. To think of being in submission to their husbands was a bit disturbing for some, but, uh, but what do you do when that is what God's word clearly teaches? A number of men and women were very appreciative of the message, praise the Lord. I had the joy of staying in the home of the church pastor and his family, and it was a great time of fellowship with them and also seeing others who uh, have become very, uh, very dear to us during our eight and a half years in Jamaica. Much preparation is in, work, in, in the works uh, to get us ready for our departure from the U.S. Ah, the joy of packing again. We have been unpacking the boxes sent from Jamaica while trying to repack for the next phase of mission work preparing needed items for at least two years and keeping with the airline baggage allowance is providing a, uh, proving to be quite a challenge. Again, we have been able to visit a few of our supporting churches as well as some of our families while uh, following the highway for about 7,000 miles. I've also made a few visits to the Veterans Hospital here in Tucson for some minor needs that are now uh, taken care of. Meanwhile, uh, meanwhile, there have been many phone calls and emails between Tucson and Sapin. Fellow missionary, Brother Scott Norman, is carefully preparing for the transition, and our fellowship has been a blessing as both of us prepare for this change. Also, uh, there, there has been some difficulty in finding lodging for us in Sapin due to the critical housing issues the island is experiencing. However, it looks like we will be able to rent a house for three months while the current renter is away for the summer. This was given. This will give time to allow uh, to look around and find something for the long term. We we rejoice that our tickets have been purchased for the trip and look forward to this new ministry and, and mission field where the Lord is sending us. Our desire is to be used of God to lead others to Himself, to see the church grow and be strengthened over the next over these next years, and for the Lord to provide a new permanent pastor for this mission church who will carry on the work uh, to the glory of the Lord. New prayer cards have been printed and will soon be mailed out to all of our supporting churches and those who have had a part in the ministry. May 6, Linda and I had the joy of celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary. Our children from China, Norway, and three states made possible a great getaway at a resort here in Tucson on May 4th and 5th. On the 6th, Darren and Chloe 
hosted a small celebration in their home with extended family serving a delicious Southwest meal and a golden cake which Chloe had made and decorated. A memorabilia display included the wedding gown and my army uniform that we were asked to model. Linda could still wear her dress and I could almost get my army, uh, army dress jacket buttoned. Uh, we are we are almost. I wonder how close to almost was. Amen. <laughs> we are so blessed of God in that all our children are saved and love the Lord, and we rejoice in our Lord for each other with the hope of serving Him together for as many years as our Savior gives us. The last section here says, Traveling to Asia, departing Memorial Day, Monday, May 29th from Phoenix, Arizona, connecting in Seattle, Washington, arriving in uh, uh, Narita, Tokyo, Japan, Tuesday the 30th, arriving on Wednesday, today, Wednesday, May 31st in Sapin. Uh, and then it gives his new address here because Sapin is an American commonwealth of the northern Mariana Islands. All mail comes through the U.S. Post Office on the island and regular postage, not international, is all that is required. Hopefully we will have a new telephone number by our new prayer letter. We want to thank you all for, the, uh, for encouraging us through your financial and prayer support. Steve and Linda Lindquist. So thankful for them and their, uh, their serving the Lord in Jamaica all those years and now a time of transition. We'll have the ushers come forward to receive the offering. We did have one prayer request that was turned in late. This is from Angela. She says, pray for my Aunt Elia's health. Her kidneys are not working properly as she has diabetes. Pray she doesn't lose hope and for uh, God to provide strength and encouragement. So we'll pray for the Linquist family, as well as for Angela's Aunt Elia. Let's pray. God, we do come to you tonight thankful for uh, the Linquist family and their service to you for so many years, their faithfulness to you. And uh, Lord, what a privilege it is to get to support them as missionaries. And as they go and as today they're arriving in Sapin, I pray, God, that you keep them uh, safe and, Lord, that you just continue to provide for all their needs and help the people as they receive them as the interim pastor there that work that, uh, Lord, the, the work would not take a step back, but Lord would even move forward for you. We also pray for Angela's and Elia that you would touch her body and heal her, help her, uh, Lord, to not be discouraged, but uh, just inject her with strength and, and, uh, and love from you and comfort from you. And we're thankful that she is saved. We do pray that you just encourage her during this uh, dark time in her life. We do pray for the offering as well, that it, as it's received, Lord, that the offerings would be used to further your work. In Jesus' name, amen. Please open your hymnals to hymn 264, Sweet Hour of Prayer, hymn 264. We can stay seated for this one, and we'll sing the first and the third, 264. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my father's throne make all my wants and wishes known in seasons of distress and grief my soul has often found and off escape the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Number three. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, may I thy consolation share. Till from Mount Pig's just lofty height I view my home and take my flight. This robe of flesh shall drop and rise to seize the everlasting prize and shout while passing through the air. 
Farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. Amen. First Kings chapter 12 in your Bibles tonight. First Kings chapter 12. And we'll begin reading in verse 16 in just a moment while you're finding your way there. Uh, I was given this note by Mrs. Surrett there, and as I mentioned earlier, the ladies are working very, very hard uh, upstairs uh, with getting everything ready for the tag sale. We do need help. If you have availability during the day to come in and help us tag items, uh, uh, you're welcome to come and do that. Uh, she said, uh, Pastor, please announce that the cutoff date for donations will be all day Thursday. We will need Friday morning to catch up on the pricing because we have received so many items, praise the Lord. And then also she says, we are in dire need of plastic grocery bags as each customer needs a bag for their purchase. How many of you like us, you got a place you shove all those empty grocery bags? Uh, try to get them up here if you can as soon as possible. That way, uh, come the day of that we can, uh, we can use those. So I was asked by Mrs. Surrett to announce that and uh, make plans coming on Friday, or, uh, rather on Saturday, and, and, and just enjoying and being around the tag sale. And if you can volunteer to help us that day as well, you can see Joan Surrett uh, for that. First Kings chapter 12, let's stand for the reading of God's Word tonight. We're going to begin reading in verse 16, and we'll read down through verse 21. The Bible says there, So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, what portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. Uh, to your tents, O Israel, now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed uh, unto their tents. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones that he died. Therefore King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel rebelled against the house of David uh, unto uh, this day. And it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin and hundred and fourscore thousand chosen men, which were warriors to fight against the house of Israel to bring the kingdom uh, again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of God came unto Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speaking to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, ye shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. They hearken therefore to the word of the Lord, and return to depart according to the word of the Lord. And tonight we're going to look at another sermon in our series through the Bible. Tonight's is entitled, This Israel's Big Split. Let's pray. God, I do pray tonight that you'd help us as we uh, study uh, just another passage of Scripture here. Uh, but Lord, it's not just any other passage. Lord, all, all of the Word of God matters and all of it's relevant, uh, even down to today. And God, so I pray that you'd help us to draw out uh, the things from this passage that will help us to, uh, Lord, be improved through you and through your Word. And uh, Lord, I pray that we'd understand your Word better and so, God, that we can, uh, Lord, uh, love you better. And so we just pray that you give us wisdom and a discerning heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Someone once said, life is all about relationships. Life is all about relationships. Isn't that exactly what we find in both the Old Testament and the New Testament? Hold your place there in 1 Kings. Flip, with, flip over with me, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter number 6 and verse number 5. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 5. There we find the Bible says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Life is all about relationships. It's all about relationships. The New Testament expands on that thought. Turn over with, you, with me to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. And 
uh, and, and Jesus again comes along. And remember Sunday morning, uh, we talked about how that grace requests more than the law requires. In the Old Testament, God had commanded that you're to love the Lord with all your heart. Jesus comes along and he adds to, he completes the law by adding a little more to it. Matthew chapter 22, look down at verse number 37 there. The Bible says, uh, Jesus saith unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, and Luke chapter 10, verse 27, you find Jesus repeating the same thing, that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. And then it gives us the uh, idea there that on these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. Now, if you're wondering how that works, how does all of the Old Testament hang on those two commandments. I had Pastor Dave make a graphic for us. You put the next slide up there for me if you don't mind. Um, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. The first four commandments of the ten, the great the ten commandments, uh, fit under this idea of loving the Lord thy God. No other gods before me. Uh, no graven images. God's name is holy. You're not to take it in vain. And to keep Sunday holy or to keep the Sabbath day holy, Holy. The idea there is that if you can learn to love the Lord your God, then you'll have no problem following the first four commandments. Throw the next one up there for me. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. What are the, se- uh, the, s- the next six commandments? They're all about uh, loving others appropriately. Honor your parents. Don't murder anyone. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. And don't covet. And if you can do these six things, then guess what? Uh, you're going to love your neighbor as yourself. And so God knew exactly what He was talking about when He said, on, on these two commandments hang all the laws and hang all the prophets. If you properly love God and you properly love your neighbor, then keeping the Ten Commandments will be a cinch. Now, the idea here of the message is Israel's big split. You can go back to my title slide there. Israel's big split. Why is it that churches split? Why is it the church is split? Now, White Oak Baptist Church, thankfully, over the years, has been a solid, strong church. Not to say there ever, not to say there never has been a wave through the church or a problem that's found its way through. The church is 37 years old. Clearly, that's going to happen from time to time where somebody gets upset or maybe a, a, a set of families may get upset and, and up and leave. Uh, and the church has been around this long, it's almost impossible for that not to happen. But uh, thankfully, why do the Baptist Church has never had a church split? The church I came from in, in uh, Hagerstown, uh, a few years before I got there, had gone through a split. And uh, there was a church across town. In fact, in Hagerstown, Emmanuel Baptist Temple was really the first Baptist church in the town. Now there are five or six others, and I believe four of them are splits off, split offs of Emmanuel Baptist Temple at different times in its history. And there is a singular man who is responsible for splitting the church at least twice, maybe three times. And so, uh, but praise the Lord, the gospel is getting preached by these other churches. But what causes churches to split? Sometimes, sometimes churches split over a doctrinal shift. Sometimes. And i got to say that if I ever begin to take the church in a way that is, uh, uh, that is far from Baptist doctrine, then a whole bunch of you need to just get up and leave. Amen? Or you need to throw me out. <laughs> One or the other. Uh, you don't sit here and let the church go away from clear biblical teaching. You can't do that. But sometimes churches split over doctrinal shifts. Other times, churches split over a shift in standards. Maybe somebody comes in and they change the music drastically of the church, or they drop all the dress standards and they just totally kick them out the door. Maybe a pastor comes in and uh, uh, he changes the version of the Bible. That one might be a little more doctrinal. Some would consider it a standard shift. But uh, nevertheless, you have these shifts in the standards of the church. The church goes more from being a contrast to the world, or more trying to uh, parallel the world or be like the world. And sometimes the churches will, uh, churches will split over that. But can I tell you that that's probably less than 5% of the time 
the church is split. Why do churches usually split? Well, usually it's over a personality conflict, a personality conflict, or it'll be over a power struggle. Um, someone said uh, about pastoring, keep your pe people busy looking outward, because if they're not looking outward, eventually they will fight inward. You know what? I have found that to be very true. I've sat in churches that had weak, anemic outreach programs, and there was just no push to go reach the community, and there was no labor hard, and, and the church was basically come and be a country club. And you know what people do when they just sit around? Eventually they start fighting with each other. They begin to fight with each other. They, they don't have enough to do. Uh, some, usually, church splits are because of insubordination, where someone is trying to jump ship, and, or rather, uh, 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 jump rank and jump over. And they had big church fights over this. And that uh, pastor of mine at the time, he wisely said, he said, the church did not split over the weather. The church split over the pride in man's heart. That's usually why churches split, usually. Um, why do couples split up? Why do couples? Now, we're, in a minute, we're going to get back to talking about what, how Israel split up. But there are some strong parallels here to draw in the introduction. Why do couples split up? Why do couples get divorced? Why do couples leave each other? Um, what does the Bible tell us in James? It tells us, from whence comes wars and fighting amongst you, come they not hence even of the lust which do war in your temples. It is because I love me more than I love you. And I want what I want, and I don't care what you want. It's about me. It's about me. Couples, couples really never split over anything good. Uh, one person said that, uh, uh, one marriage counselor that I was reading, reading his, his writings, he said that the number one thing he works to do in fixing marriages is to get two people to start acting like adults and get them to quit acting like juveniles. Because they fight over trite, silly things that just really don't matter. And they'll go hard at each other and they, they wash away the foundation of their marriage and before you know it, they, they have developed animosity one toward the other. Uh, uh, why do families break apart? You'll see children, adult children who won't talk to a mom or dad anymore. You'll see uh, adult uh, siblings that no longer interact with each other. From whence comes wars and fightings and what caused Israel to split It says there, for it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Letter A, we see Solomon's imperfect heart. Solomon's imperfect heart. I'm not going to dwell here real long because we looked at this last week, but Solomon's heart had been at one point perfect toward the Lord. He loved God. He followed God, he sought after God with all his heart, and, and, and he was all about building the house of the Lord, and built this massive temple, and, 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 and laid everything in gold, and here you had uh, Solomon who got down on his knees and prayed a very, very long prayer, dedicating that temple to the Lord, but Solomon began to marry these other women from these other countries, most likely because he was trying to establish political protection. If I marry the daughter of this king, he's not going to attack my country. But what Solomon forgot was it wasn't his wisdom of marrying these girls that kept him safe. It was a mighty God that was going to keep him safe. But nevertheless, David married all these women. And I believe for a while, David held their political and religious views at bay. But as I spoke earlier, there was this undertow. There was this washing away of what Solomon believed. And Solomon eventually gave in. And Solomon's heart became imperfect. Became imperfect. Now his love for God was divided between his love for God and his love for his wives and his love for his things and, and pleasing them. Can I tell you tonight that I don't think Solomon fell into the trap of following the idols of his wives because he loved those idols. I think he loved his wives. His wives were the idols. Letter B, we see Solomon's idolatrous heart. Look down at verse number 5 of 1 Kings chapter 11. The Bible says, For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination 
of the Ammonites, and Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Amnon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrifices under their God and the and, and, under their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appointed unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after the gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, and list, watch this in verse 11, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou shalt not, uh, th thou hast not kept my covenant, my statue, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant." And we'll learn who that servant is here in a minute. But what happened? Why was the kingdom rent from, from uh, Solomon and from uh, the family, the, the throne of David? Why was that the case? Was it because of Rehoboam's bad decisions? God used that, but that decision was made long before Rehoboam was ever even established as king. That decision was made under the hand of Solomon. Let me just share with you tonight how I think that God maybe had uh, worked here. In this scenario, Rehoboam watched his dad be a hypocrite. You realize the book of Proverbs was written by Solomon to Rehoboam to know how to rule and reign. I don't think that, that Solomon simply wrote the book and just handed it to him. I think Solomon probably made a collection of all of the different times he had sat Rehoboam down and had taught him. These were one-on-one, -on -one, most likely, conversations that Solomon had had with Rehoboam. He had said to him, you see how the dog returns to its vomit? You see that right there, Rehoboam? That's how a fool returns to his folly. This was a book written of Solomon having taken the time to invest in his son. And Saul, Rehoboam, no doubt, at one point respected his dad, but then watched as his dad became a hypocrite began to serve other gods. And Rehoboam learned hypocrisy from his father. You see, if Solomon had stayed in the way, most likely Rehoboam would have stayed in the way. But Solomon strayed and showed the life of a hypocrite. And Rehoboam would come along and he would act the part of a fool, of a fool. Parents, what you do matters. What you do matters. And I will even take it a step further. What you do when you're out of eyeshot of your children matters. You think, oh, well, they'll never know. Trust me, God has a way of them finding out. And whether or not they find out, God has a way of getting your children oftentimes, uh, uh, or rather, your children oftentimes will follow in the same steps and make the same mistakes that you make if you're not careful. So be very, very, very careful to stay in the right path. And that's not just for those with little ones. Some of you have adult children. Stay on the right path because your children are still watching you. Number two, we see the character of the Bowen boys. We've looked at the cause for the split. Number two, the character of the Bowen boys, or you could say the character of the kings, the first two kings here. Letter A, Rehoboam. Rehoboam was spoiled and foolish. He was spoiled and foolish. Look with me over in 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse number 6. Here you have Solomon, the wisest man ever to live, and he produces maybe uh, one of the most foolish kings ever to live. Look at verse 6 of 1 Kings chapter 12. And King Rehoboam uh, consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived and said, How do you advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt uh, uh, be a servant unto this people this day and wilt serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him and which stood before him. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we have spoken uh, to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. Notice the counsel of the young men. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. 
And now, uh, whereas my father did, uh, uh, did laid you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father hath chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. The backstory here is that Solomon had come in behind David, and he had raised taxes. Don't you love it when taxes get raised? No. <laughs> uh, nobody likes when taxes get raised. And Solomon had raised taxes, and Solomon had done so with a pure heart. Solomon had raised taxes to raise money to build the temple. And the people got behind that. But the temple had been built, and Solomon was gone. And the people come to Rehoboam and their tax burden is very heavy. And they say, please, Rehoboam, if you'll just back down the taxes, we will be loyal to you forever. Solomon says, why don't you give me some time to think about it? He goes into his, the council of his father, uh, the, the older men, and he says, they want me to back down. What do you think I should do? And they were older men who were wise. Solomon, no doubt, had surrounded himself with some of the wisest counselors or the wisest cabinet he could have. And they said, listen, you need to listen to the people. Back down the taxes. And he sat there, and that was not what he wanted to hear. So he goes to the younger men, his buddies that he had grown up with, the foolish ones that he had grown up with. To use a church youth group idea, these were the rebellious kids in the youth group that sat on the back row, slouched down, that never listened to any of the preaching, right? Um, and he goes to them and he says, hey, uh, they say that, you know, they want me to back down the taxes. What do you guys say I do? They say, go out there and you tell them who's boss. You say this, you say, my pinky will be thicker than my father's thigh. My father chastised you with whips. I'm bringing out the scorpions. I'm not lowering taxes. 80% wasn't enough. 95% you'll pay. Now, I don't know what the percentages were, and neither do you, but, uh, but uh, nevertheless, they were going up. They were going up. Let me make a couple comments on this here today. As someone who regularly gives counsel, as someone who gives counsel to people uh, on a daily basis, I, and I will say this, I really try to live by the principle, I don't give my opinion unless it's asked for, uh, and that's a good way to live. Uh, what's the old adage? Advice, uh, advice uh, that isn't solicited is seldom heeded, right? If someone's not coming to you and asking you for your opinion, don't walk up and just stick it in there, because generally... Uh, they're either going to resent it. At the very least, they might be polite, but usually they're not going to accept it. They're going to reject it. But I have people come to me, and uh, they're seeking my advice as a pastor uh, on a daily basis. And can I tell you what I find with a lot of people? They're not really looking for my advice. They're looking for my endorsement on what they want to do. They're coming to me, and, and, and then if they don't hear what they want to hear, they'll go find someone else that will tell them what they want to hear. And then they'll walk around and say, well, I got counsel. I got counsel. I got advice. And they maybe had to sh shop around for 25 people to find that person. And they finally find the person that says, yeah, go ahead and do it. And they run with it. And the Bible does tell us that in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. But that doesn't mean that you run to a multitude of people to hear what you want to hear. You're going to a multitude of people and you're combining the council and you're putting wise people around you and then you're spending some time in prayer about it. What happened here with Rehoboam? He heard the right advice, but he rejected it. And what happened? He was spoiled. He was a spoiled brat and he made a foolish decision. It's hard for me to find anywhere in the Bible where someone grew up in a home where they had it all where they did not act like a total brat. In fact, if you go throughout the history of our country, some of the people who grew up in the deepest of poverty are some of the people that did the greatest things. A lot of times when people grow up in a cush lifestyle, they just really don't do a whole lot. They kind of coast. And listen, if you grew up in a cush lifestyle, I'm not saying you can't do something great, but I'm saying you need to acknowledge it, and you need to say, I'm going to step out of my comfort zone and I'm going to do something big. Let her be. Notice Jeroboam was skeptical and fearful. So you might, if you're here tonight and you don't know your Bible real well, you might think, well, Rehoboam, Jeroboam, they were similar names. Were they twin brothers? 
The answer is no. Were they brothers? And the answer is no. Rehoboam and Jeroboam were not related. We do know that Jeroboam served in Solomon's palace. Uh, look with me at 1 Kings chapter 11, one chapter back from where we were, and verse number 28. God handpicked Jeroboam to be uh, Israel's first king after the split. Look at verse 28 of uh, 1 Kings Chapter 11, the Bible says, And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, and Solomon, seeing the young man, that he was industrious, he made him ruler over uh, all the charge of the house of Joseph. And it came to pass at the time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah the uh, Shilonite found him in the way, and he had clad himself with a new garment, and uh, uh, they too were alone in the field. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take the ten pieces, for thus the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will rescind the, uh, the, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to thee. So what happened here was that uh, 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 Jeroboam's leaving the palace. He had just got a new coat and put it on, and God sent this prophet, and he catches him in the field, and he takes his jacket from him, this new jacket, and he tears it. He cuts it into 12 pieces. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone gives you a new jacket or you go out and buy a new jacket, you're not going to want to see someone destroy it, right? Uh, today, they were going through some stuff upstairs for the tag sale, and they got this really nice Under Armour uh, uh, hoodie, sweater. It's probably a $50, $60 uh, thing, and, and I bought it, amen? I, I couldn't let that go in the tag sale. It, it looked too nice to let it go. I bought it, and I'm excited about that thing. It's getting a little too warm to use it anymore. Uh, I'll have to wait a few months, but uh, I don't want you going up and chopping that into 12 pieces, that's what happened to Jeroboam. And he said, what are you doing? And he said, well, ho, ho, I'm, 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 I'm illustrating something here for you. And he took the 10 pieces and, of the jacket and he gave it back to him. And he said, God is going to tear away the kingdom from Solomon. And he's going to give you 10 tribes. Jeroboam was handpicked to do this work. Now, look down at chapter 12 and verse 26. So uh, uh, the, the, the story leading up to this is that the people hear Rehoboam come out and say, uh, my pinky's going to be thicker than my father's loins and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chastise you with scorpions and all Israel revolted. They went back to their tents uh, ten tribes left. They got out of there, and, and, uh, and, and Benjamin and Judah were left for Rehoboam to rule. The other ten tribes, uh, they stayed there uh, for, uh, for uh, Jer uh, rather, they took off and they chose Jeroboam uh, to, to be the king. Look at chapter 12 and verse 26. The Bible says, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the king kingdom return to the house of David. If the people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord, at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of the people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me, and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah, whereupon the, the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in, the, in Bethel, and the other uh, put he in Dan. And this thing became a sin for the people, went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places and uh, made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth, Eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that um, uh, is in Judah, and he offered upon the altar, so did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made, and he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. And so he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day uh, of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. And he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. So Jeroboam, they make him king and he becomes fearful that, hey, these people are going to, uh, uh, as tradition states, when it comes time for the sacrifice, they're going to go back to Jerusalem. They're going to do their sacrifices there and Year after year, eventually, this whole this uh, wall divided between north and south, between the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom, is going to get broken down, and they're going to kill me, and they're going to go back and let Rehoboam rule over them. So what should have he done? He should have built his own temple and allowed the people to worship their God there. But that's not what he did. Instead, he formed calves of gold, and he put one in Bethel, 
Put another one in Dan, and he said, these are the gods that brought you out of Egypt. Go and bow down and worship them. Letter B, notice there Jeroboam was, Jeroboam was skeptical and fearful. He was skeptical that the people would return. He was fearful that they would return. And so he instead turned the hearts of the people away from God and to idolatry. Number three, notice the chronology of the kings. We've got to move quickly here. The chronology of the kings. Now, um, you, you, got, you got there... Uh, a, uh, a handout uh, inside your bulletin uh, of all of the various kings. If you could put the next slide up there for me, uh, Brother Matt. Here is a rendering of what the kingdom looked like there. The northern kingdom would have been Israel. That's the ten tribes. The southern kingdom would have been Judah. Uh, and that, that is where they reign. You see Jerusalem there toward the top. The people would not have had to travel far inside the border there uh, to, to get to Jerusalem. So instead, he put uh, a place, and they're not on the map there, but he put a place in Dan and Bethel. So the northern kingdom is Israel. The southern kingdom is Judah. The southern kingdom is Judah. And uh, there, let's see, I believe on that map, actually I have that broken down a little bit wrong. So I'll give you something to cross out at the top there. The left side should read king of Israel, and that's the north. The right side should read a king of Judah, and that should be the south. So make that correction there at the top. King of Israel on the, uh, on the left, and that's the north, and king of Judah south, that would be on the right. So I, those just need to get inverted or, or flip-flop there. Uh, you can see there that, uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the country of Israel, they had 19 kings, all of them neglected God. All of them would lead the people to, uh, to, to worship idols. After the split, uh, uh, there, they, the northern kingdom or Israel would be around about 220 years. And Israel as a nation would be completely disassembled by the Assyrians in A.D. 710. So the Assyrians would come down. They would invade. They would carry away the northern ten tribes for good. For good. They would never ever come back around and be uh, a solemn country ever again. The, the, um, the southern uh, tribes of Judah, uh, they fared a little better. Of the 20 kings that ruled in Judah, eight of them either served the Lord or made some effort to serve the Lord. Not all of them were perfect toward the Lord, but eight of them made some effort to recognize God and let Him be the true leader of the country. After the split... Judah would be around approximately 345 years. So they would outlast uh, Israel, the, the northern uh, kingdom there. Uh, they would outlast them by 125 years. Uh, Judah was then led away into captivity for 70 years by Babylon. And uh, uh, they, they would then reassemble as a country uh, until taken over by Roman rule, which would last through the end of the writing of the New Testament. And truthfully, uh, even while they were under Babylonian rule, eventually uh, other kingdoms would come in. They were eventually released and allowed to go be their own country, but they were still underneath government rule underneath other governments that would come in and run them. So there you have the list, uh, Jeroboam all the way down through Hosea on the left. They were all disobedient. They all were idol worshipers. Rehoboam down through Zedekiah on the right. Eight of them did what was right. Uh, uh, let's move on. Point number four, we see the corrupted kings. The corrupted kings. Of the 39 kings that collectively ruled Judah and Israel, 31 of the 39 kings were disobedient to doing things God's way. Let's quickly highlight just a few of, of these here, of, the, of, the, of these kings. First, uh, uh, you see there I have in red, Ahab. Ahab. Now, as you read through these, turn with me over to 1 Kings chapter 16. As you read through the kings, and you get to the various ones, they're compared to their fathers. And uh, up until you get to Ahab, they're all compared to did evil inside of the Lord as unto Ahab their father, rather as unto Jeroboam, like unto Jeroboam, until you get to Ahab. Ahab raised the bar for evil. Look with me at, um, and Ahab was Israel's seventh king. Look with me at 1 Kings chapter 16 and verse 30. The Bible says, And Ahab the son of Omri did evil inside of the Lord above all 
that were before him, above all that were before him. So uh, Jeroboam no longer is the standard of evil. Now uh, Ahab has knocked him off, and Ahab and Jezebel packed a pretty strong one-two punch. By the way, I, I just want to throw this in here real quick. Jezebel is a name you'll never hear anybody named anymore. But take away all of the evil connotations that come along with Jezebel. You know, she's a Jezebel, right? All those comments. Can you see how the name Jezebel could, could have been a pretty name that was around still today? It, it sounds nice coming off the tongue, but there's all those evil connotations that come with it. How evil do you have to be to completely ruin a name forever? She lived thousands and thousands of years ago, but nobody in their right mind names their daughter Jezebel. We'll turn over to 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 13. 1 Kings 18, 13, it says there, Was it not told my Lord uh, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord and how I hid in a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water? So you have uh, all of this evil that Ahab did. And, and, I, and I, we're running really short on time here, but I wrote down a couple of things. Uh, you have the story of Naboth's vineyard. Uh, you have uh, Ahab, uh, during that time, Ahab went out and he wanted the vineyard and Naboth wouldn't sell it to him. So basically they had him knocked off. And so she could go in and Jezebel could go in and take it and give it to her husband and just all kinds of wickedness. You have the killing of the prophets here. Uh, Ahab became the standard of evil. Uh, the next king I have noted, this would be on Judah's side, and that was Manasseh. Manasseh, highlighting one evil king from each side. Manasseh was Judith's, uh, Judah's 14th king. We don't have time to read it, but uh, Manasseh uh, in 2 Kings 21 would lead the people to offer their children up by fire unto the Lord. They were actually taking their children and, and having them burned alive burned alive and and Judah did or rather Manasseh did great evil in the sight of the Lord and at the very end of Manasseh's life he would repent and God would spare harsh judgment on him but would rather take it out on his children that would follow uh, uh, point number five notice the cherished kings the cherished kings Asa Jehoshaphat Joash Am Amaziah Azariah Jotham Hezekiah and Josiah these eight kings to some degree were obedient and followed the Lord. They followed the Lord. I'd like to highlight just a couple quickly. First, Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was Judah's fourth king. He was Judah's fourth king. And there was great revival that took place under Jehoshaphat's rule. He, he really had a desire to return the country back to running it the way that, uh, that David did. How many of you remember the sermon I preached several months ago about how uh, the, 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 the nation was under attack and they put the choir out front? How many remember that sermon? They put the choir out front and the choir led the army as they went to the place where the enemy awaited. That was Jehoshaphat's idea. That was Jehoshaphat's doing. He was the man that totally trusted God with his heart. And Jehoshaphat would make some errors along the way, but Jehoshaphat by and large loved God and revered him. The other king I'd like to quickly acknowledge is Josiah. Josiah. Josiah was Judah's 16th king. Here's some notes about this king. He was eight, eight years old when he began to reign. I've got an eight-year-old at home, and trust me, he's not ready to run a country. Sometimes Matthew's sitting behind my desk, and, and he'll open my Bible, and he tries to pretend like he's the pastor of the church. And so I'll walk in, and I'll sit down in the chair, and I say, what you preaching on, Pastor Matthew? And I'll say, well, I preach, and he'll turn over, and, and his sermon will be about six words long, and he doesn't have anything else to say. Um, he's not ready to pastor a church of 150, 100, 200 people. He's definitely not ready to run a country. Josiah was handed the reins on some level at eight years old. I totally handed over to him a little bit older. But um, some notes about Josiah. And if you want to do a, a character study on a king, wow. Josiah was a great king. Uh, he repaired the house of the Lord. And in his repairing of the house of the Lord, he discovered the word of the Lord. And all this is in 2 Kings 22 and 23. The word of the Lord was discovered. He didn't even know what it was. It had been buried. And so he, he has it read before his ears, and he has it sent out for interpretation by a prophetess. And it comes back to him, and 
he realizes how wicked and evil they're living. And so he repents of the evil deeds of his generation and Judah's past generations. He then purges Israel of idolatry. And by the way, when I say he purged Israel of idolatry, he goes all out in purging Israel. He breaks up every high place. He has people uh, who are priests killed and their bodies burned. Uh, he has uh, 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 Baal and, and all the idols torn down. He even goes as far as digging up the bones of those who had led the country in idolatry and he burns their bones. That's how serious he was about this. And then he even went as far as reinstating the Passover. Josiah was a great, great, great king of Israel. I would really encourage you to study out their lives there and get in the Word of God and read and study these. Again, we're looking at this from a bird's eye view, and this is a lot of material to cover in just uh, one week. Uh, Proverbs, let, me just, let me just finish with this. Proverbs 16.25 says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Can I assure you that all these evil kings, they thought they were doing the right thing. But they weren't because they weren't doing it God's way. They weren't doing it God's way. Remember, in most splits that take place, whether they be church or family, usually there is pride and sin at the very center of it. Pride and sin at the very center of it. Choose God's way and completely remove sin and take away the avenues to easily sin out of your life. There are some of you here tonight and you may be dealing with some sort of a split in your life right now or what feels like a, the beginnings of a split and it's not your sin that's causing it. It's more the other person's sin. My admonishment to you is take care of yours and trust, and trust them to the Lord. If you're, dealing with a, if you're dealing with a relationship conflict, if you're dealing with strife in your marriage, strife in your home, strife at work, stop and ask yourself this question, am I sinning and causing this? And then confess it. And let's not have a split here at the church. Let's not have a split in homes based on our sin and our pride. Let's have our heads bowed and eyes closed this evening. God, I do pray you'd help us tonight as we look deep down in our hearts and examine where... Maybe there's strife like there was in Israel that caused this great country to divide. And Lord, I pray that, that those divisions would not happen in our midst. And Lord, I, I do pray that you'd help us to come clean and confess our sins in those areas. Lord, I know of several here tonight that are going through a difficult relational experience. And God, it really isn't the person who's sitting in the pew, but rather someone else that is living in gross sin. God, would you get hold of that, those people's hearts? Would you turn them around? Would you show them that their, their way is wrong and your way is always right? But Lord, I pray tonight you'd help us to be a church that's unified, a church that's together so we can uh, greatly do our job to reach our, this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Give us a good time during your invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. We're not going to have a formal invitation tonight with the piano playing. The hour's late. And I've gone way over, but I would like for you to take just a moment in your pew. Will you just pray silently for a moment and ask God to purge you of any pride or sin that is causing strife and ask Him to take that away from you? Lord, I do pray that you would even remove it from my own heart. And Lord, I pray we'd be humble people God, that are accountable people and that uh, keep sin away. And God, sin creeps in in the most subtle ways, and Lord, we're all susceptible to it. God, would you remove that? Uh, remove that from our heart and the, even the love and affection we may have from sin. Would you take that away from us? Help us to be people that have relationships that are healthy, where we love you and we love others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, instead of putting the slideshow up with the announcements, I'm...